So I'm British, as you might be able to tell. And, yeah. um, that was and my guess. I have, a, I, have a, I have a lot of admiration for the free speech part of American exceptionalism, because it really is a part of American exceptionalism to say, we have this. It's something that we do in the US. In Europe, including in Britain, but I'm particularly thinking of Germany, there, that isn't the case. Uh, in Germany, it is illegal to, to deny the Holocaust. It's illegal to do that. And it served them well, I think. So do you think that the American way is the best way? I mean, I know, or do you think there's merit in the way that liberal democracies in Europe deal with some of the extremes of free speech? I think it's the best way for America, <clears throat> but I do think it's highly contextual. Um, I'll, I'll give you the following um, example or story with this. Um, I spoke at a, at a conference uh, sh on the one-year anniversary of the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Rabin uh, that was held uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. The scholars were Americans, British, Germans, and Israelis. And the topic was violence conducive speech, not violence threatening speech, which most everybody would agree at some point can be um, criminalized. I mean, conspiracy talk, uh, literal incitement at the point of, of criminal violence. Uh, but this was violence conducive speech, violence that gives rise to a climate that would, uh, that would encourage um, a speech that gives uh, comfort to that. Interestingly enough, it was the Americans, to a certain extent the British, who had the position of by and large being speech protective. It was the Germans and the Israelis both more willing to repress that speech because it makes sense. Those are the two legal systems that grew up after the Second World War in the shadow of the Holocaust. Um, one of my German colleagues at this conference afterwards said to me, I'm willing to bet that if there were brown shirts marching up and down Fifth Avenue throughout the 1930s and 40s, you would not have the same views of free expression that you have. And I told him, I suspect you're right, that on some level these things are contextual. It is against the law in Germany to fly a swastika. It is not against the law in this country to fly a swastika, and I don't think it should be against the law to fly a swastika. I think that the community should act with revulsion. I think a civilized community should push back on that, and that is going to be, in my view, the best protection against neo-Nazism that will ever come. Uh, as Learned Hand said, when the spirit of liberty dies in the, in the, in the hearts of men and women, uh, then no constitution can save it. But we didn't live through 12 years of the Third Reich. Germany did. And so for them to say it is just too dangerous to have a, uh, a swastika flown is something I'm at least willing to listen to. Now, they just elected uh, for the first time since the Second World War uh, a right-wing party into their parliament. Had the law been that you may not vote for members of that party and they may not sit in parliament, I think that would have raised very different questions. And interestingly enough, that is not the law in Germany. But just to put a, you know, a, a final point on this, we are the outliers. We, the United States, are the outliers on our treatment of, uh, of hate speech. There is much more aggressive legal uh, right to repress hate speech in Britain, as you say, in Germany, uh, in Canada, in New Zealand, in France, in Italy. Um, and I would not say those are not liberal democracies. I think they have different histories and different legal cultures. There's a cogent theory that says the freedom of the press in the First Amendment is best understood as part of a system of checks and balances as established in the original constitutional structure. We typically think of checks and balances in terms of the three branches, the federal government, the federal government, and the state government. But in fact, if you think about the Constitution uh, as, a, as a civil society creating document, it actually creates uh, protection for religious institutions, for the press. It actually was designed to set up other sort of pockets of accountability and authority in the society uh, precisely to be checks and balance uh, on other kinds of, uh, of power in the society. So in that sense, the freedom of the press is, is not just a, a right that comes, but actually a set of obligations to the media to play that role of checking and balancing other sources of authority in society. College, and from a journalistic standpoint in a college setting, this is a really unique social ecology in that we all live and work in the same place, which can, and we have experience with this at our paper, and I'm sure other places do as well, um, 
issues where the public and private spheres often overlap and those lines can become confused and, and blurred in certain ways. Uh, an example that was brought up um, tonight was the example of the uh, eviction notices being posted on student stores. The arg arguments surrounding those kind of demonstrations and those kind of political statements are that you, know, you don't want to bother people in their own private space where they live, and yet you're working and living in the same place. People are sort of debating these ideas in the academy, but you're also going to your home. So my question, and this, this applies for both, for both speakers, is to what extent can people reasonably expect their private lives to remain entirely private while discussions of significant ideas are occurring around them? And how can student journalists report on major disagreements in ways that don't violate people's private spaces? Well, I'll take a, take a crack at that, and then I'll, I'll let the, uh, the, the, the journalist uh, take it from the journalist side. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, it, it is a different context, and that gives uh, certain opportunities that the college community has that other places wouldn't happen. Um, so several times now I've talked about the, the president should say these are the values of the society, uh, and that kind of speech is not consistent with the highest values of the society. Um, I would want my dean of students, my provost, my president uh, to say that from time to time. I would not be nearly so comfortable with my mayor or my governor saying, you know, those, those words are not consistent with the highest values. Uh, I, I think the, the, the uh, president or the, of the country, the governor of the state, is allowed to articulate certain kinds of, uh, of you know, high principles. But I could say something about the president of the university that I don't think you'd want to say about your mayor or your governor. I could say that at some level, to use an old-fashioned term, uh, the president and all of the members of her team and ultimately her faculty uh, are responsible for, among other things, the moral education of the students. I mean, we don't talk that way that much anymore. Um, but that notion that that's part of what's going on here. You're being educated not just in terms of book learning, but to become the people that, uh, that, that you would want to become and that this college will be proud to have you become. Um, that's a kind of involvement in your lives um, that really does make the public-private quite porous in a way that I think in a liberal democracy we'd be much less comfortable. You know, with the mayor saying, I'm responsible for the moral education of my people. That's kind of cringeworthy uh, to, to think of the, of the mayor or the governor talking that way. Um, and then coming to the, to the media piece, um, the, the line that, that at least uh, defamation law, for example, tries to draw between public uh, figures and non-public figures, you know, public figures lose certain rights in terms of privacy, in terms of right of, uh, of others to write about them. No one can be intentionally defamed. You certainly are able to do something about that. Uh, but the standards, as you probably know, are very different um, for a public figure. It's interesting that the, that the Supreme Court actually came very close at that time, right after the decision that recognized the public figure test, to expanding it to be public subjects, subjects of general public interest, that the media would be protected more broadly in any claim for defamation, uh, defamation with any public uh, subject. They never went that far, and then they pulled back since. So I think that sort of probes to have a public-private line, that people who have not chosen to put themselves into the public sphere as public figures are entitled to withdraw from these discussions to a certain extent. Those of us who have chosen to put ourselves in those positions um, are part of the discussion and all of the slings and arrows that come with it. I think um, basically if there's a, a case, as Fred described, where um, ugly signage has been, been put on someone's dorm room. Um, that is a story that, in my opinion, should be the focus of a Trinity tripod story. Um, and if I were the editor or an advisor, I would say I try to talk to the students in the dormitory. If there's a junior advisor or resident advisor, I try to talk to her or to him. I'd definitely be talking to the dean of students. Um, what are you investigating? What are we going to do about it? And I'd write a news story. I'd also write an editorial that, that sharply criticizes that kind of conduct on a civilized college campus. Um, I think Fred um, has gotten at a very interesting point in terms of First Amendment law, and that is the closest a story comes to a public official in their public duties, the latitude for making a mistake in the press is the broadest. Under the law, the story not only has to be false, 
and it has to have damaged the person's reputation, but it has to also have been written with a reckless disregard of the truth. Otherwise, it's not defamatory. When it comes to a private citizen, um, it, the standard is negligence. So if um, one of the faculty members has a rare edition of um, Henry David Thoreau's Walden Pond inscribed to his Aunt Clara, and he's going to give it away at a um, party that's worth $10,000, and a, a reporter gets wind of it, and the, guy, and the owner of the book says, nope, I'm a private guy. This is just for my friends. Leave. The reporter has absolutely no right to pursue that story. It's private individual, private matter. But a, a problem at a dorm, that's a good story for the tripod. And I think good reporting, shining a light on an issue like that, can help the whole campus. I don't think um, the founders, the writers, the authors of the Constitution, or any of the great theorists of liberal democracy ever understood that the debates on which civil society rested would be conducted in statements of 140 mm -hmm. characters each. <laughs> and um, quite apart from Twitter, the environment in which discourse occurring is, is occurring seems to me to be one in which sustained argumentation is being, sus is being consistently undermined by virtue of sound bites. And I, just, and I despair at this. I teach philosophy as it happens. And so, uh, and so I'm just wondering what is to be done? Um, I, I think we inside the academy continue to represent civil discourse that is sustained, that takes time to make a case and to reply. And we listen to each other through, that, through those words. It's not happening out in the world as far as I can see. And so I just wonder if there's any hope. Thank you. Well, I think there's always hope. Um, I uh, was, uh, was, was trained to, to believe that <clears throat> when, we lose, when we lose hope, we've lost everything. So uh, we, we, we hope to, to the end on this. But I think, I think the challenge <clears> of <throat> the kind of discourse we have is real. Uh, let, me, let me first give the, the counter to that, and I'll come back to it. Um, we're living in the moment right now, which makes it very hard to know just how different this really is. If you look at the the writings both within uh, the legal profession but also uh, the humanities um, at different times of technical innovations. Um, you, you see all the things that are going to change the world as we know it, right? The telegraph is going gonna, is gonna to change privacy as we know it. Cameras will change privacy as we know it. Um, television, that's the end of everything. Um, and so, you know, all of these things are going to be dramatic changes and yet they get in some ways uh, <coughs> brought together and we, we move forward. So we're too close to this one to know, you know what, what happens. Now, having said that, it, it does feel different. And I can't tell if it's just because it's close to me too or because this one really is. Um, no, the founders weren't thinking about Twitter. They weren't thinking about a 24-7 news cycle. Uh, they weren't thinking about the ability to do uh, subliminal, um, uh, not only advertisement, but through bots to be able to change the discussion, to be able to, to get something to, to the top of uh, the Google uh, page that is not only false, but is known to be false by the perpetrators. And I'm using that word carefully, by the perpetrators of these stories. This is not somebody who's got a, a different view that I happen not to share. This, these are people who know it's false when they do it. Um, and they are able to, to make that spread in a way that's, that's far wider than anything that could ever happen before. Um, I guess the hope has to be the same thing that makes it possible to spread it, makes it possible to combat it. Um, and it's necessary to, to, to fight back uh, in that sense. I think Brandeis, when he said the answer to, to bad speech is more speech, also probably understood uh, what technology could mean. The, the, the fellow who tried to shovel sand against the tide never really got very far with that exercise. So it, it seems to me that we need to deal, you know, as we do within these, uh, uh, with, within these same innovations. This gathering tonight is a good example of what we should be doing around the nation and around the world. Um, a civilized, in-depth discussion, an exchange of ideas um, that really elevates everyone's understanding and knowledge and gives us a chance to discuss some um, potentially inflammatory issues in a, in a civilized, thoughtful way. Um, I personally post on Facebook almost every day, and I tweet. 
but I do it only for one reason, to promote good inquirer work. And um, I think the web has both great um, advantages and beauty, but also great disadvantages. And um, I sometimes wonder, you know, which, which, way, which outweighs the other the most. Because now everyone is free to opine, and they can opine to thousands or tens of thousands of people if they get, attract the right audience. But the dangers are the dangers that I read to you from the New York Times story. The idea that a small cabal of people would insidiously plot how to create a false impression um, is repugnant. And in 20 years ago, that couldn't have happened with the speed or effectiveness of today. I'm going to read a question from one of our remote viewers. Fred, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'll give you a remote answer. Okay. <laughs> um, many things that would pass the free speech test are damaging to the very environment the college aims to create. How do we balance the legal standards of free speech, especially as they apply to tenured faculty, with the college's stated, stated mission of fostering an inclusive campus community, embracing diversity, and each person's opinion is just that? Well, the first part of the question, it seems to me, is something we've been talking about, which is that uh, there is such a thing as protected speech that is damaging to the community, and the answer is still is not to repress it. It is uh, ultimately the strong, strong presumption is that speech is protected in order to make sure we have fostered the widest kind of uh, opportunities for expression, including bad expression. Where it is damaging to the community, um, then the community has to respond. And you know, I've been putting this at the, at the doorstep of the president up until now because I, I think of it in terms of, you know, to a hammer everything looks like a nail. What, what would I do in that situation? How would I have handled that? Um, but it's, uh, you know, just like it's the minister is not the only one who's supposed to worry about the sick, uh, everyone in the congregation should. Um, the, the president is not the only one who's supposed to respond to that. And I think we see that in terms of uh, campus vigils that, that will happen. Um, we'll see that in terms of, uh, of outpouring of support uh, on campus. I was uh, in between my time at Brandeis and the time I was at, uh, came to Phi Beta Kappa, I had a uh, sabbatical year at Yale as a uh, research scholar at the law school. That happened to be the year at Yale of the, uh, the brouhaha over uh, Halloween, just, just about this time of year. Um, it was a very interesting thing to live through, to be sure. But one of the things that really struck me, living in one of the residential colleges, as my wife and I did, was to see how students um, were attentive to each other uh, during that time. Um, and there were some students who were really suffering through, through that time. And part of what had to happen was up at the institutional level, and some of it was at the human level. So I think that's a, that's a part of it, too. On the, the level of, of tenured faculty, now we actually uh, breach into another issue we haven't really talked about, but should for a moment, um, and that is the, the sort of correlative uh, issue of academic freedom, which is related to free expression, but different from free expression. You know, academic freedom uh, is the notion that the institution has to provide an environment in which the kind of scholarship and learning and teaching can go on in, a, in an unrestricted way to foment ideas, discussion, debate, uh, and, and analysis. But I would associate myself with those who have written that whereas free expression is ultimately an individual right. I have a right to express myself uh, and the Constitution protects my right from interference by the state or the federal government to express myself. Academic freedom is really better understood as a, as a right that the institution, not the college exactly, but the academy has. And that you as an academic are part of that, that process. Uh, and that your work has to be protected in order to, to do that. Not every kind of expression is protected by academic freedom, obviously, uh, but one's academic work, uh, broadly defined, uh, is protected by academic freedom. And that's not just about tenured faculty members, that's all faculty members. Well, fortunately, I actually did have a question. Excellent. Um, several times, Fred, you've, retur you've referred to the, the notion that the, the, response, the best response to bad speech is more speech. But we live in a world in which the speech of some, because of money, drowns out the speech of many, many others. And to me, this is as grave a problem as the other problem, the fake news, the 4chan kind of story. Um, and 
in the, in the absence of a Supreme Court decision that changes the view that money equals speech, I don't see much reason to hope that this situation will be remedied. If the solution is more speech, what can we do about a system in which the inequalities of money lead to inequalities of, of not literally speech, but the ability to get that yeah, speech. The ability to amplify out. your speech. Yeah, yeah I, I, look, um, I, I think Citizens United, um, the, the Supreme Court case, which is actually the culmination of a doctrine that starts in a wrong-headed way, in my view, uh, that, that considers uh, money to be a kind of, of, of protected form of speech, that it's not that each individual has a right to speak, he has a right to spend his, his money to amplify that speech as much as he wants to. Um, I think it leads uh, to a, uh, sort of inexorably to this result which is inconsistent with, with liberal democracy, and I think the dissenters uh, in Citizens United uh, got that one right. I think we've already seen the consequences of it, and I think over time we'll continue to see the consequences of it. Um, the, Hope springs eternal on that. Uh, just as a digression, you will note that Bill and I both uh, started uh, with two of the giants of First Amendment jurisprudence, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Louis Brandeis. Uh, but if this discussion were taking place during the 1920s and 1930s, they were most famous in First <laughs> Amendment decisions for the tagline that said, Justice Holmes and Brandeis dissenting. Um, they were routinely dissenters until the law begins to change. So, who knows what happens over time with the changing. So that's the first thing I would say is I agree with you that Citizens United was wrongly decided um, and that in the fullness of time, it may yet collapse under its own uh, weight as I think an argument that ultimately does not, uh, does not bear up to, to logic of the, the structure of the constitutional system. The other piece I would say until that day comes is that although you're right that you can amplify in many ways with money, um, speech, here's where technology actually plays a very constructive role. There are very cost-effective ways now of being able to amplify one's views widely. And there are pernicious aspects of that, as we've been talking about. But just as there are pernicious aspects of that, there are positive aspects of that. Um, and I can tell you, you know, bringing everything sort of closer to home, one of the things that we've been very engaged in um, at Phi Beta Kappa, in addition to our free expression work, is our traditional work advocating for the arts and humanities and sciences, which these days, among other things, means advocating for federal support for the National Endowment for the Humanity, National Endowment for the Arts. One of the things that we tell our chapters and tell our student members of chapters is that it is surprising how small a number of well-written and non-identical communications to a member of Congress or even a senator on the same issue will get that member of Congress's attention. So people think you need millions of dollars to get a, uh, attention paid by a member of Congress. A member of Congress gets 100 emails, texts, tweets, phone calls, or letters about the same topic that are clearly not just cookie cutter, yank and crank communications, but, but actual you know, thought out communications. Some staffer is going to walk in and say, hey boss, there's something going on in the district. We've got to pay attention to this. So it doesn't take millions and millions of people. Um, there, there's a lot more power out there for citizens to use. Uh, and this, I guess, comes back to the hope question. We, we must not lose heart. Uh, we, we, we are, because we have the potential to play this role, and then I think we must. Uh, and I think it is terribly important now more than ever that we not lose heart. Well, um, Fred, thank you.